Obama's back. Perhaps not since Roosevelt in the early 1930s was there such populist anger at Wall Street and the unnecessary wars of empire. But then an unexpected thing happened. Obama betrayed his earlier promise and became the first candidate to run in a general election to reject public financing in favor of private financing without limits. McCain, who took the public option, was badly outspent two to one. In this period, Obama turned quietly to Wall Street funders with deep pockets like J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Citigroup, as well as General Electric and other defense contractors, computer giants, and the pharmaceuticals industry, Big Pharma, which reversed years of supporting Republicans, giving Obama three times as much as McCain. Few of Obama's supporters complained at the time. His victory in the national election was applauded across the world. A new America was here. Though conservatives would absurdly decry Obama as a socialist, by far the biggest winner in the election turned out to be Wall Street. Obama brought back the same economic team that under Clinton had done so much to deregulate the economy. The New York Times referred to them as a constellation of Rubenites, acolytes of the most powerful Treasury Secretary in decades, Robert Rubin. After nearly wrecking the world economy with spectacular innovations in leveraging and speculation, several giant banks, insurance companies, and mortgage lenders prophesying the collapse of the world's economy if they went under, they were, in other words, too big to fail, eagerly accepted a $700 billion bailout on remarkably easy terms. In addition, the Federal Reserve Board cut the interest rate for banks to 0%. It became almost unpatriotic at the time to question the rightness of these financial rescues. But there were those who wondered, could not some of the sicker financial entities be let go and broken up? Could not these giants be confronted with the real market value of their toxic assets? The public wanted revenge. It was a classic Depression backroom moment, as illustrated by Frank Capra. You sit there back at your big cigars and think of deliberately killing an idea that's made millions of people a little bit happier. An idea that's brought thousands of them here from all over the country, by bus and by freight and jalopies and on foot so they could pass on to each other their own simple little experiences. Why, look, I'm just a mug and I know it, but I'm beginning to understand a lot of things. Why, your type's as old as history. If you can't lay your dirty fingers on a decent idea and twist it and squeeze it and stuff it into your own pocket, you slap it down. Like dogs, if you can't eat something, you bury it. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker urged Obama to act. Right now, when you have your chance and the breasts are bared, you need to put a spear through the heart of all these guys on Wall Street that for years have been mostly debt merchants. But it didn't happen. The bailout was forced through a panicked Congress. The media applauded. The Treasury made no immediate demands that bankers make that money available in new loans to businesses or the public, or for that matter, cut their personal compensations. It made no demands that shareholders or bondholders absorb any losses. Taxpayers would fund the bailout alone. The biggest losers over time would be workers, pensioners, older people with savings, homeowners, small businessmen, students with loans, and those, especially African Americans, who lost their jobs to a surging structural unemployment problem. Many simply lost their tenuous grip on the proverbial American dream of joining the middle class. The myth of upward mobility was shattered. The bankers, or banksters as they were nicknamed during the Great Depression of the 1930s, had talked of voluntary restraint, but received record compensation packages for the next two years. Whereas CEOs in Britain and Canada earned 20 times as much as the average worker in 2010, and in Japan, 11 times, in the U.S., CEOs made 343 times as much as the average worker. The number of billionaires went from 13 in 85 to 450 in 2008, while the minimum wage stagnated at $5.15 an hour from 97 to 2007. The poverty rate was higher than at any time since the 1960s. The net worth of the average American family actually dropped almost 40% 
from 126,000 in 2007 to 77,000 in 2010. By 2011, the top 1% had more wealth than the bottom 90%. Populist anger boiled over into the Occupy Wall Street movement, a kind of protest not seen since the 1930s. The right-wing Tea Party expressed a different kind of anger fueled by advocacy groups like Americans for Prosperity, largely funded by the conservative billionaire Koch brothers. The confused American public, not knowing who to blame for persisting economic hardship, handed the Republicans a sweeping victory in 2010's midterm elections. But only more gridlock and confusion pervaded Washington. Obama, who'd swept to office amid such euphoria, now walked a fine line, avoiding fatal mistakes, but failing to deliver on hope or change. During the 2008 campaign, the constitutional professor had promised transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. Yet, in office, he refused to relinquish the expanded powers usurped by the Bush administration. As a passive population continued to consent to being stripped in front of airport screeners, permit eavesdropping on their communications, and pay for vast new security programs. It did not make political sense for Obama to ease this heightened state of alert in the risk that a single terrorist incident would certainly result in renewed media hysteria and a Republican, I told you so, firestorm that could cost him his presidency. Ever in the middle of all this coming at you think maybe one term is enough? The one thing I'm clear about is that I'd rather be a really good one-term president than a mediocre two-term president. Instead of fighting for transparency, however, Obama became a far more effective manager of the national security state. Like Bush, he repeatedly invoked the state secret's privilege in lawsuits involving torture, extraordinary rendition, and illegal NSA eavesdropping. He blocked habeas corpus rights for enemy combatants, preserved military commissions, and authorized without due process the killing of a US citizen in Yemen, accused of having ties to Al-Qaeda. Obama stunned civil libertarians when he took Bush-era investigations to the next level and began prosecuting government whistleblowers and reporters using the World War I-era Espionage Act. Only three cases had been brought in 92 years. Obama initiated six cases of dubious merit, most defendants claiming to have exposed unlawful activity in the government. Most prominent was Bradley Manning, an army intelligence analyst in Iraq who leaked over 260,000 classified diplomatic cables and war reports, as well as videos distributed by WikiLeaks, a non-profit whistleblower media organization. These revelations of U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan and U.S. support for dictatorial regimes in the region proved to be a significant catalyst for the Arab Spring uprisings in Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, Libya, and Bahrain. Nonetheless, Obama's administration has severely impaired the operation of WikiLeaks and threatens to prosecute its co-founder. These actions send a clear message to all whistleblowers. Commit war crimes like Bush and Cheney and you walk free. Expose them and you risk careers and huge fines. Or, like Manning, you rot in jail. One of the leading defenders of the new standards of conduct, Jack Goldsmith, former head of the Bush Office of Legal Counsel, reassured Cheney and other anxious neocons in an article saying that Obama was like Nixon going to China. The changes he had made are destined to fortify the bulk of the Bush program for the long run. This was a new shadow world. In 2010, the Washington Post called it an alternative geography of the United States, a top secret America hidden from public view. Almost a million and a half people had top security clearances. More than 3,000 government and private security corporations existed. 1.7 billion emails and communications were intercepted and stored every day by the National Security Agency. Political commentator and constitutional lawyer Glenn Greenwald 
best described this truly radical change in our world when he wrote, the core guarantee of Western justice since the Magna Carta was codified in the U.S. by the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law.